Wesley he was a man of one book. Give me one book in that book alone. He read everything that he possibly could because he really believed we need to be knowledgeable on everything that we possibly can. John Wesley paid attention to every one of the new discoveries, every one of the you know, phylum filings for each one of the different types of plants and animals and the stars and all the thoughts they thought about physics and all those things. Wesley thought that we were supposed to understand these things. That God, our Creator, placed us in a place in our universe where we could discover and search for Him back. That we were not clouded in where He placed our planet. That He allowed us to be placed in a place where we could learn, where we could develop, where we could discover and advance and bless and do for each other. Now how to just how to tell if it was good or not? Well, there's a thing in your bulletin today. It's called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. It is Super Bowl Sunday, and it is not a football play with four laterals. Okay? It is not. Though some people would think that it is. A quadrilateral means four things. Okay? It's four sides. It's a building block. John Wesley said the first of the four sides was Scripture. Everything that we experience in life should be able to be judged by Scripture. The things that Jesus was doing, if you judged them by the things that were done in the Old Testament, by the promises that were made, by the prophets that were given, and the prophecies that they gave, then they saw that this one was God. So we have Scripture, which is the basis of the quadrilateral. Now, all four of these are not equal sides because the Wesley four square plan for applying all things to life, right? Well, you've got Scripture, and then you've got reason. Does it make sense? Yeah. Now, does it make sense that the devil's going to do things to make life better for people? Just to deceive the whole world and partake them all away. He's not going to do that. Let alone the fact he can't do that. He does not have the power to heal. He does not have the very power of creation in his touch. Because he was not a creator. He was a created. Jesus, part of that holy we, a part of that us in the beginning, let us make them in our image. Jesus was a part of that. The Spirit was a part of that. Now Wesley says that we go with reason. It needs to make sense to us. Because he knows faith does not. Faith has nothing to do with reason, does it? If it did, we'd all be able to move mountains, wouldn't we? Because we can believe things in our mind and not necessarily embrace them fully in our heart. And on the same token, there's things we can embrace in our hearts that we don't necessarily embrace or believe fully with our minds. We're really complex, messed up creatures, aren't we? It's who and what we are. It's where we are. It's how we were created. It's a part of that free will that is in us and ever churning and working against what would sometimes be our very own good. That's where the Pharisees were struggling. They were churning. They wanted to say they had it all already figured out. Every new truth that comes, it all comes from the fact that it is a little bit of a contradiction of another proven truth, isn't it? And that's the problem with it. God's forgiveness. Forgiveness, if you've never known it, is hard, isn't it? We've all felt that we have to earn respect, right? What if so 
somebody that has spent their whole life and they've never felt that anyone has given them any of the respect they've deserved. It turns away after you've done it. It makes them separated. It makes them unable to give respect back. It makes them unable to fully interact with others. In the world today, they say you should only respect those who are worth respecting. That's not very good with who is. That's like saying you should only love those who are worth loving. And how many of us are worth loving? Not much of the time, right? Jesus calls us to respect and love everyone. That's the thing that makes the church so different. That's the thing that makes the church a place of hope, a place of promise, a, pray, a place of real possibilities. Well, tradition says that, well, you can't let this in or you can't let that in or you can't do this or you can't do that. Or you can't, or you can't, or you can't. How many of us were told at one point in time or another by some other human being that you should never go to a dance? That you should never play cards? That you should never wear a bikini? <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, you know, um, that you should never cut your hair. Um, that you should always wear a dress. That you should, I mean, yeah, all these things that people have put on to things. That you should never, that you should never, that you should never. Some things are just not good for the spirit, okay? It is never good for anyone to drink a gallon of anything alcoholic, right? It's barely good for you to drink a gallon of water unless you space it out over an entire couple of days, okay? But I mean, all these things that, that, that we do in life, there is not but very few that are forbidden that we're told to avoid altogether because, well,
and the next day it carried him on. So he knows that through all things, God is in them, doing them, and watching over them. And he knows also that that is the rare happening of a horse for it to heal like that, that that is not the everyday occurrence. And usually when things like that happen to horses, more times than not, they need put down. Because angels supposedly don't heal on horses. Experience. The Pharisees were not experiencing Jesus, were they? They were just experiencing all the chaos that Jesus was causing. Is he of God? They had to be afraid to say yes. They had to be afraid to say no. It's even worse. If you're a religious leader, how do you say, I don't know? I haven't decided yet. I can't tell for sure. He sure seems like it. But you know what? He says some things that I just don't understand. I know when I say I don't know to you sometimes, you look at what? But I do know I always tend to follow it up with, but I'll find out and I'll get back to you. Because, I mean, I don't always have an answer for everything. John Wesley knows he didn't always have an answer for everything. And how many of us always have an answer for everything? Or if the first answer we spout off with is right or wrong or indifferent, right? The only one that did have an answer for everything was Jesus. And it wasn't always the answer they were expecting. They came to Jesus with someone caught in adultery, and they said they were caught in the act. Scripture says to stone them. Jesus says it sure does, doesn't it? So get your rocks ready. And those of you who don't have sin, toss that first one and get it started. Go right ahead. Who can toss a stone in? It was not the answer they wanted. Because let's face it, the God of the Old Testament sometimes seems harsh. Sometimes seems like he'd prefer to wipe everything out and start all over again. Just think if he had done that. Free will would have been gone this time around, wouldn't it? If he just decided, I'm not even going to bring Noah through. Knowing that Noah's descendants would grow and just become what we are today. And that they would be of so many different minds, of so many different habits, of so many different ways. That Jesus just calls them together. In the time of Jesus' day, the Pharisees were the big boys. They were uh, what I guess what we call the Roman Catholic Church today. Because the Roman Catholic Church is the largest Christian denomination. Okay? That's who the Pharisees would be. The Sadducees would probably be us. The next biggest denomination. The ones that, you know, have an idea of about everything. And then there were the ones like the Essenes, the ones who would separate themselves off and live wholly and only separate lives, not interacting with anyone who wasn't a chosen person of God. There were just the regular, everyday Jewish people that were just Jewish in birth alone, who weren't really too interested in any of the other things. They just wanted to live their lives and got trapped between all these people pressing from all the different directions. These were all the people that Jesus was trying to speak to. Same way with today. As he tries to speak to each of us in that voice, in those ways that we hear him, sometimes we hear him happily, don't we? Sometimes we hear him happily when he says our names and he calls us to him. 
Sometimes we don't hear him happily when we see the things that he calls us to do, the ways that he calls us to live, the ways that he calls us to interact. But we know we have ways that we can test all things to see if this is really where he's taking us to. Is it scriptural? Is it tradition? Is it reasonable? Is it an experience that was good, that was righteous, that was uplifting? And it's probably of God when it falls into those things. John Wesley's early test of it as far as leader of the Methodist Church was concerned was about a woman who was preaching. He had licensed her to preach. What a horrible thing back in the 1740s. I mean, yeah, a woman preacher in, in, in of all places in the Anglican church preaching to all people. John Wesley got called out on it. And he says, well, I applied this test to it. Are there women leaders, preachers, and teachers in the Bible? And he answered it, yes, there is. Okay. So that's number one. Scripture's not against it. So if Scripture's not against it, tradition says it has happened, what does experience say? Have you heard her? Have you heard the way she shares the good news? Have you heard the way she prays for people? Have you heard the way that she interacts? Have you seen the way she loves? Well, what does experience say? And then what does reason say? If she seems to be filled with the Spirit, if she seems to be doing the work and will of the Father, who in the world are you to quench the Spirit or tell her to shut up and quit preaching? Wesley got some growls at that response. But so did Paul when, he, when Gamaliel said that to him when he was wanting to go persecute Christians. He warned Paul, if you are struggling against something that God is doing, you will be found to be struggling against the very will and acts of God. And what did Paul find out on the road to Damascus? That he was struggling against Jesus and Jesus came to him on that road, knocked him off his horse, blinded his eyes, and prepared Paul for the one that to become the one that was going to share the gospel throughout all of the known world in their day. It's an amazing thing what God will do. We just have to be able to give him the, the room to do it in. And just trust that what he is doing is for our good. Let us pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our church's place in your church. We thank you for our founder, John Wesley, who really, really wanted all of us, Lord, in your kingdom. Who really wanted all of us on that safe shore. We thank you for the gifts that you give us to help to discern what's going on around us. Help us to live in those ways. Help us to do those things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, would you please turn to page 12 in your hymnal for our communion liturgy this morning. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. 
We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not heard the truth.
He took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He passed it amongst the disciples, saying, Take and eat all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it. He passed it amongst the disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you. This is the, my blood poured out for you and for many as the sign of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts and bread and juice. May them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast in his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 